Deborah, thanks for coming in today to talk with me a little bit about your past history coming to UCI, um, your philosophy around doctoral training, and your research. So let's start with your decision to come to UCI. Uh, you were already an extraordinarily successful scholar at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison and had uh, designed and fielded what became recognized as one of the uh, top longitudinal data sets uh, uh, in terms of resource infrastructure for the country. Can you tell me a little bit first about the that data set that you you put in place, and then then we'll move to talking about some of the research that grew out of it. Back in 1988, um, there was a um, very big debate going on in the United States about whether um, early child care was a risk factor for young children. And it came out of the work and attachment um, where there were people who said if children are away from their mothers on a regular basis that they'll be less likely to be securely attached to their mothers. Yeah, and, and women were increasingly in the labor market. And as, and as women were increasingly in the labor market, we had reached just about that time where about 50% of the women with children under the age of three were in the labor market. So the director yeah, and, of the- and, and married women with children became the most likely women to be working after around 1980 or so. Right, so, so, the, yeah, so all of that is happening. And the director of NICHD, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, du uh, Dr. Dwayne Alexander, um, convened a group um, to say, is this really a risk or not? And the, the expert panel said, we don't have the research, we don't know. So NICHD invested in what was a study that initially started out to be focusing on children in the first three years. And they had a, a competition, people applied, and uh, I was one of the, the 10 um, principal investigators at sites around the country that were funded to do this study. It was a different kind of study in that it was run like a corporate board that would, uh, there was not just one CEO, though it was really a, a, a meeting of 10 equals that had to make decisions. Turned out that was a very good um, training to be <laughs> to, <laughs> to start to run a school. Faculty yeah, yeah, to run a faculty meeting or so. But at any rate, we we got together ten independent investigators to design a study. We started it. Um, the first of the children were recruited in 1990, and then uh, we did the first uh, five years looking at the children to age three. And we. And, and what age again did you recruit them at? Birth. We, 1,300 children were recruited at birth where we were going to be focusing on all aspects of the children's development because we were all influenced by Yuri Brown from Renner who said we really needed to look at context and development in context. So we were going to focus on their early childcare experiences but also their families and looking at their cognitive development and their social development as well as their attachment, the mother's health. So it, was a, it ended up being, even at the beginning, we were really framing it as this comprehensive study of development. And uh, after the, the, uh, the children reached age three, we made an argument to um, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development that by age three, we couldn't speak definitively. <laughs> on was early care going to be a risk factor for children. So we got a, the next round of funding, and then we got the next round of funding, and then we got the next round of funding. And um, uh, the NICHD supported the, this project um, until the children were adolescents age 15. And then um, at that point, um, uh, they said, we're not going to invest further. But I got m money from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation to take the children to um, uh, the end of high school. And we're in the field right now with taking the, the study children are now 27 years old. And I think this time, 
we may be able to really speak more authoritatively about are there long-term effects of early care. Oh, some of the really negative dire outcomes are observable, right? right. Uh, incarceration, deaths, suicide, right. drug addiction. Right. So we'll be able to know, and what, but, but what was the real strength of the study is that we have these very careful, detailed observations of the children's experiences in childcare, with their families, later when they go to school, later in their out of school settings. We have these very uh, detailed, careful, thoughtful observations and reports of their experiences starting at birth, going through early childhood, going through middle childhood, going through adolescence, and now coming um, into adulthood. Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's important to emphasize, right, that those early measures, or those measures of, of child care context, school context, they were observational, right? right? So this wasn't just the parents saying they were happy with right. and satisfied with the child care. Tell me a little bit about the, the observational measurement that was occurring in these So studies. we recruited these 1,300 children. They were in all kinds of child care. They could, be stay, they could be in centers, but they could be in child care homes. They could be staying with a nanny. They could be staying with the mom or with the dad. All the, kinds of the things. So they're grandparents. Grandparents. So they could be, um, and so the question was, how are we going to be assessing the quality of these experiences? We were um, influenced by uh, the work of the time that was telling us how important um, communication and interaction it is, how important having sensitive and responsive caregivers, how important it was for them not to be ignored. So we went in and started observing children in their settings, focusing on their experiences um, over a two-day period. And then the, while we were doing it, um, I took responsibility for the, for the child care observations I did with Allison Clark Stewart, the person who recruited me here to, uh, um, from Wisconsin. And it was, it was a little scary because we were creating measures that theory suggested to us should be important. But those measures, we were creating them. And you go, can we train observers? Can we, can we train 40, 50 people around the country in these different sites, Arkansas, Wisconsin, Virginia, Seattle, Irvine, can we train them to observe as if they were one person and use the same kind of metrics in these different kind of settings? And um, I have to tell you, I am thrilled when I can tell you that those early observations are predicting outcomes at the end of high school. And I, in terms of the quality of those early experiencing, predicting outcomes at the end of high school, who knew? Yeah, and it is incredibly challenging because of the, like you said, the varied settings right. that the child care occurs in. Right. Uh, unlike the elementary school classroom where the common protocol is, is easy, much easier to apply. Right. You know, one of the things, too, that we did, which um, I, I, I think it's really interesting, then we were focusing on our study children. So we were very egocentric when we would do these observations. We were looking really at the extent to which that setting was meeting that child's needs. So you could see a teacher, maybe she had four or five or ten children she was taking care of, and she might be working really hard, and she might be really meeting some of the needs of this child or that child, but if it wasn't our target child, we were really looking at it from the perspective of the individual child. And I think that's part of why it was the power of those experiences for predicting later outcomes. It's interesting because Carol Connor in the project that she's doing now with her A to I. Carol did her training and did part of her training with one of the study investigators. And she got this lens, I think in part, from thinking about focusing on individual children. And that's what she's doing now 
with her observations, is focusing on the extent to which those experiences are, are meeting individual child's needs, children's needs. And I think that that's going to be, the NICHD study sort of forecast that as a way. It's really interesting now that Carol's work is um, building on some of those same ideas so right, successfully. Right. But, uh, and, and that interaction between the, the child and the adult is, is co-created, right? Because right. the child yeah. uh, is, the child plays an active role right. in right. soliciting the uh, attention from the adult and, right. and uh, you know, it's not just the adult creating a, a no. positive relationship. No, it's not. No, it's, the, it's what the child is doing and that those interactions um, we use that same lens going all the way through for looking at uh, in, in the later preschool period and later on. So it's really focusing on how are settings meeting children's needs and how are children interacting in those settings and building their skills. One of the key findings uh, I know from your research is that these early childhood experiences really matter and predict later success. And I think. A lot of the rest of the field is caught up with that, and you know, even uh, economists like Jim Heckman now will uh, assert the importance of early childhood. Right. Uh, but some of your later work uh, looked not just at early childhood, but these out-of-school, after-school experiences also being uh, equally important. Right. Uh, tell tell me a little bit about that, because that seems uh, today more of a surprise maybe to people. Right. So. When I uh, started, uh, I was really interested in the early childhood period. And when I, in the mid 80s, I was doing uh, my first study asking if there were some longer term uh, relations, effects of these early childhood experiences. And so this was sort of 82, 83. And uh, when I did this study, I was going to be looking at some children that I had looked at initially as preschoolers, and they were in third grade. And I thought to myself, oh, I'm going to be studying these third graders. Maybe I should uh, measure what they're doing after school and use it as a control variable. <laughs> and so I went in, and uh, what I saw of their, their out-of-school experiences were so interesting. I thought, oh wait, and, we, and the findings were kind of surprising that I started going, I think I need to be paying, we need, we, developmental psychologists, educators, uh, all of us need to be paying more attention to what's happening after school. And so then I really started sort of two lines of work, continuing with the early childhood work, but then also focusing on after school and out of school time activities as a developmental context. So what kinds of children experiences are, are elementary school kids having after school and how is that related to their um, outcomes in elementary school? And then as always happens with me, I always want to know, well, okay, these were what we're seeing at these after school experiences in elementary school, does that carry over to high school? And it's uh, now I'm interested in, so what happens if you put elementary, if you put in early childhood and these after school experiences? And the most recent papers that I'm doing using the NICHD study of early child care data set, um, we're finding at the end of high, at, the, at age 15 and at the end of high school that children's experiences in early childhood are important children's experiences in out-of-school time are equally important. And is it, do you think it's the after-school programs the, that it connects the youth to their, their interest, or is it the, the adult relationships, the quality of the adult relationships okay. they're having okay. out-of-school out that's, that's driving these results? We've tried, to, we've tried to sort that out. But if you, the children are having engaging activities, that's important. If they're having some interactions with peers there in the settings, that's important. But we find the major driver is the quality of the interactions with the adults in the program. 
And it's that relationship with the adults that um, often bring the young people to the activity, and it's what keeps them there. Now, the, either when they're there, they're also doing activities, but those caring adults, interesting adults that do interesting things, that's, that's the, the lever. And if the, if the relationship with the adult is not there, the kids usually won't keep going. The whole body of work as a sociologist, you know, modern society, because it's so age segregated, has this really, uh, creates a very unusual experience for childhood where they're often not in contact with adults, right. except in the ways that, that you're studying. Right. As opposed to the more historically patterned activity where children grew up or around adults working in the fields and hunting and gathering and uh, right. there were always kind of adult interactions around. Right, and those could be with uh, their parents, but they could be with uncles, aunts, and people who were also working in the, that community so that they could be serving as mentors for them. But uh, yeah, it's uh, um, the importance of caring relationships with adults be they teachers or after school staff or early childhood teachers or relatives, really important. And this, this, this latest wave you're doing where they're age 27, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are you solely looking at outcomes, uh, uh, adult outcomes to track back to their early, earlier uh, experiences or also parenting practices, uh, or do some of them have children now and okay. looking for how that is? That second uh, generation, how that that's next, transmitted. Right, right. So we're, we are um, looking at a, a wide variety of outcomes. I'll uh, remember back, Dr. Alexander, director of NICHD, came in and he said, think of your protocol as a moonshot. You have this uh, capsule that you're going to be able to take into space. So I'm thinking as we're looking at this age 27 protocol, we're going, what are all of the areas that's going to be important for us to assess? And how can we do it as um, efficiently as we can to get really good data? Because we only get one shot, if this moon shot this time. And so we're doing um, educational attainment, we're doing um, uh, employment, so uh, co occupations, kinds of occupations or work that people are working, at, are working in. We're looking at relationships, their um, uh, ability to develop meaningful relationship with a partner or where they are in terms of those kinds of relationships. Are they um, forming a family now? Do they have children? What are their views about children if they have it? We're also looking at um, uh, um, substance use, involvement with the criminal justice system, uh, their relationships with their um, family of origin, uh, their relationships with friends, and we're also, th uh, we're, their civic engagement, they involved with the political process, did they vote? Um, how, do they how do they define themselves politically? They involve what kinds of uh, physical activities are they involved with? Um, social activities. So, ev we I, we ended up um, or I ended up talking with colleagues around the country who are experts in adult development for twenty-year-olds, and I uh, said, okay, um, what 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 have we got to assess, and how do we best assess it? And so that's what we're doing. What originally motivated your interest in educational research and, uh, and early childhood? When I was an undergraduate, I uh, took some courses. I went to, I was an undergraduate at Rice University, and I took some courses that really transformed my life. And I think that's partly why I'm so invested with this undergraduate major that we have. And in one of the courses that I took, it was in, a, it was in the sociology department, and the faculty member let us observe where we wanted, but 
I ended up going to look at some of these new programs that had just been started not that much before I had um, was uh, an undergraduate, and it was, they were Head Start classrooms. And some of the ones that I went to see were wonderful, and some of them not so good. And as I looked at them, I had seen too, there was a report that had just come out that was saying that the Head Start findings were mixed. And I thought, well, how could they not be mixed? Look how different these programs are. And I, I so I thought, I really want to go to school and study this. I think these programs, I think these early childhood programs could really have a big effect. And I think that the quality of those programs is really going to make a difference. And here I am, you know, 50 years later, looking at it. And was there anything earlier on in the, your family background that led to, to be, that interest in kind of early childhood education? Oh, that's a good uh, question. Well, that's, oh, that's a really good question, too. So, um, uh, my mom was a, um elementary school teacher. She taught second to fourth grade. And um, when I, uh, after I was in graduate school, I went back and observed her. She's really one of the best teachers I've ever observed. She, her, she, her classroom was just amazing. But um, it was back in a generation where there were no other opportunities for women in the workforce other than being teachers. Right. And her class, though, if you just, she had what were basically workstations all over her class. I mean, very different kind of things. And the, the uh, she was, she um, taught in really low income schools. And they always gave her the children who, if they were, this, they were her, this was their last chance to learn to read. And she did it in a way that was so fun and interesting for them. It was, it was great to see. But my dad was a vocational agriculture teacher. And so there I saw out of school time and the role of out of school time um, every day of my life because we would, have, uh, we would have those high school boys coming over Saturday morning. Is Mr. Lowe there? And because uh, somebody would be having some trouble <laughs> with a steer or with a sheep or with a chicken and they had to have help right then. You grew up in a rural community? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where, it was, uh, I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, so it's a, it was a, a working class uh, refinery town, but there's a lot of rural space there, so um, um, I raised cattle when I was growing up, and uh, my dad was, um, uh, we, we had uh, high school boys needing uh, help all the time. Great. Well, thank you so much, Deborah, for sh sharing <laughs> these insights with me today. My pleasure. Great. Thank you for inviting me to your office.